Okay, thank you all for joining us. My name is Suzanne Godby Inglesby. I'm the Associate Director of Indiana University's Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Democracy and Collections presentation today. Today, we are very happy to have with us Heather Aku, who is Associate Professor and Co-Area Coordinator of Fashion Design in the Eskenazi School of Art, Architecture, and Design. She is also director of the Elizabeth Sage Historic Costume Collection at Indiana University, and very recently uh, has become the co-founder and co-director of the Dress and Body Association, which is a new international organization. We're gonna pop information about that into the chat. So in a moment, I will turn this over to Heather. Um, I just wanted to say that this semester, these talks about democracy and collections at various repositories, archives, libraries, museums, um, these are related to this uh, semester's semester theme of democracy. And so we're glad that you're all joining us. We're thankful to those who are taking their time to share with us about the various collections with which they work and are engaged. Um, we'll be monitoring the chat, so please feel free to put your uh, questions, comments, any interaction that you wanna have in the chat and we'll be sharing that as we go along and there will definitely be time for Q&A at the end of this presentation. But Heather has graciously said that this can be as conversational as we'd like it to be. So feel free to chime in there and we will make sure that that um, gets to Heather if she's in the flow of things. So. <laughs> With that being said, I will turn this over to Heather. Thank you very much for being with us, Heather. We look forward to hearing about the Sage Collection. Yes, definitely. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this. It's really interesting linking the collections with the democracy theme. There are lots of different ways I could talk about Sage, but um, I think this is a pretty exciting way to look at it. So um, what I'm focusing on for today is uh, because of democracy, thinking about what is the role of collections in democracy. And I think, especially for a collection of dress and fashion, the real advantage we have is that we can really help to humanize experiences. So I'm talking today about the 1% and the 99%. This is something that's been around in political rhetoric for several years now, thinking about the extreme, super wealthy, and then the rest of us, the 99%. But I think it's really important to realize that everyone in that spectrum is a real person. And um, I'm sorry that we can't be together in person to actually look at objects because this would be an even more powerful experience. But I think you'll start to see what I mean as I talk about what you can learn from different types of objects. So first I'm going to talk just a little bit about how the Sage Collection was formed, if I can get my, oh, there it goes. <laughs> Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how the Sage Collection was formed, how it's grown, and then we'll get into a couple of specific cases. And definitely feel free if people have questions, Suzanne is welcome to interrupt me with questions or comments, totally fine. All right, so the Sage Collection is named after Elizabeth Sage. She was the first professor of textiles and clothing at IU, and she was hired in 1913. The university had decided to form a department of home economics. In a lot of schools, home economics was established in the late 1800s, often as a separate school. And that would be kind of the school that female students were directed to. It was kind of a way to allow women to enroll, but not actually to include them in the rest of the university. But at IU, that was not the case. Home economics was established later. It was established as a regular department in the College of Arts and Sciences, just like any other department in the college. So we have kind of an unusual history in the realm of dress and fashion studies. So anyway, so Elizabeth Sage was the second person who was hired and um, she was a professor at IU until 1937. She was uh, hired in a, ten a tenure track position. So she did get tenure while she was here. And um, she was really an early pioneer in the study of clothing and fashion history. So one thing she did is she wrote a textbook called A Study of Costume. And um, this was a very early, I mean, this was before the concept of 
fashion history even was really solidified. This is a very, very early fashion history textbook. And you might notice that she used the word costume. We're gonna come back to this, but in this case, costume doesn't mean costume like performance costumes, like stage or ballet or Halloween costumes. It means a study of what people wear. She deliberately did not use the term fashion. In fact, she talks a little bit in the introdu introduction about why she doesn't use that word. She thought that fashion wasn't really a great thing. <laughs> um, she didn't want people to be too focused on trends. So at the time she was basically teaching two different kinds of students. So she had some students who were there because they wanted to become or were already high school home economics teachers and they needed to learn some things about sewing and cooking and you know family relationships, all the different things that the Department of Home Economics had to offer in order to be effective high school teachers. The other population of students that she was teaching were women who, you know, envisioned themselves getting a degree, getting married, not really working outside of the home. However, what was really valuable about getting a degree in home economics and specifically uh, involving clothing is that during this time, many people were still making their own clothing at home. It was becoming possible to go into a store and buy ready to made ready to wear clothing, but it was still very common that people made their own clothing. So to have skills not only to make clothing, but to actually um, design elegant clothing and really make things that look beautiful and were well produced, that was a really uh, highly appreciated skill. So when Sage was first collecting items for her. Uh, for her students, she really had, this was really a teaching-based collection. She wanted her students to see historical examples, to see examples of clothing uh, from Europe, to see how high-end, really beautiful things were made. And so this was, from the start, a very teaching-focused collection. So I have a little photo on the right-hand side that shows an exhibit from 1946. Very rudimentary exhibit, nothing, I mean, these aren't on mannequins, they're just on hangers. It's nothing like the kind of exhibits that we would put on today. And these were really, again, meant primarily for students. I'm sure there were some people from the general public who also saw them, but mostly it was geared towards students and towards learning. So fast forwarding to today. So when Sage retired in 1937, the Department of Home Economics excuse me, decided that they wanted to keep her collection and she was willing to let the department have the entire collection. So they accepted it as a permanent part of the department and um, they started to appoint other people to oversee it. And the collection has grown over the years. Um, there was an appraisal in the 1960s that showed the collection had grown to several thousand objects. Um, now the collection is up to about 30,000 objects. It's an enormous collection. It's one of the oldest and largest collections of costume and fashion in North America. There are a handful that are larger. The museum at FIT has about 50,000. The Met in New York has about 50,000. The Chicago History Museum also is about that size, but we're not far behind. And definitely as far as university collections go, we are one of the largest university-based collections of fashion in the world. So a lot of what we have is uh, our mission is very focused around Western fashion, so Europe and North America, but we do have clothing for both men and women and for children. Um, and we have not only clothing, but also quite a variety of accessories, hats, corsets, shoes, eyeglasses, hand fans, um, underwear, you never know what's going to be in our collection. If it goes on the body, it's probably something that we're willing to collect. Uh, we also recently uh, were given an amazing collection of historic sewing tools. Um, so that's another thing that's become one of our specialties. Um, our collection is stored now at the Auxiliary Library Facility, which if anyone is thinking about doing research, um, right now access is pretty limited just because of COVID, but when the pandemic's over and things kind of, you know, hopefully return to normal, um, it's really an amazing storage facility and has dedicated rooms for people to actually pull objects out and spend some time looking at them and studying them. Okay, so one collection we have we have some kind of 
big sub collections within the Sage collection. And one of our most recent sub collections is the Glenn Close collection. So um, it's very unusual for actors to actually keep their costumes and props when they finish. Sometimes it'll just be, you know, a thing here or there. Like for example, um, the person who plays Thor for Marvel has kept some of the hammers. <laughs> Apparently he keeps one in his bathroom. Um, so sometimes people do keep things, but um, Glenn, at the, big, at the very beginning of her career, she was always really fascinated by costumes and how they really, uh, they're a very important part for her of getting into the character. So she always, uh, she, from the very beginning, she started having it written into her contract that she could keep her costumes when she finished. Um, we also have some things from her that are not performance costumes, but are notable pieces that she's worn, for example, for awards ceremonies. So last year, she was nominated for an Academy Award for the movie The Wife. Um, unfortunately, she did not win. She's been nominated seven times and still does not have her, her uh, Oscar Award, which is really a shame because she's a phenomenal actress. And I think The Wife is quite an amazing film. Um, but anyway, she was really prepared to finally have this be the win, and she had this dress made by Carolina Herrera. Now, this dress um, has over four million glass beads. They were all individually sewn on the dress by hand. It weighs over 40 pounds. It is an amazing dress. Now, I've only shown this to a handful of people. We haven't had it for very long. And there are basically two questions people ask with this dress. How much did it cost? <laughs> Which, honestly, I don't know. I just know that this is really an invaluable dress. I can only imagine what it might have cost, Glenn. The other question is, can I touch it? Now, generally when things come into our collection, we don't touch them anymore because uh, we have many things that are made of natural fibers, and in general, natural fibers degrade over time the more you touch them. It not only puts stress on the materials, but it also transfers oils from your skin to the clothing, and that will stain it and cause it to decay much faster than if you didn't touch it. So we don't touch the objects that are in our collection with our bare hands. Of course, we touch them with gloves because we need to be able to move them around. Um, now, this is a very unusual thing <laughs> about this collection. Glenn actually, as part of her gift, retained the right to wear these items again. The reason is because occasionally she does a reprisal of something. So for example, we have her costume, some of her costumes from the original production of Sunset Boulevard in the 1980s. And when there was a reprisal of that show a few years ago, some of the costumes were repurposed. So she has the right to take those costumes out of the collection and use them again, which is a very unusual situation. But this idea of, can I touch it? This is where I think the really humanizing element of our collection comes in. Because the experience of dressing the body is a universal human experience. There is no part of the world where people don't do something to their bodies. Most people wear clothing, but even in the rare cultures where people don't wear clothing, they wear other things. They wear, you know, jewelry, they paint their bodies, they, they wash themselves, they apply oil. We all do something to our bodies. And so on a very human level, we can instantly appreciate what it means to wear an item of clothing and kind of project yourself into that person's clothing. So I think when people want to touch these objects, it's not just the, you know, celebrity attraction of like, oh, Glenn Close wore this and now I got to touch it. I mean, maybe that's part of it for some people. But the thing is that we all know what it's like to touch clothing and it just conveys so much of the experience of what it would be like to wear that dress. It really allows us to, to put ourselves in her shoes. Okay. So Heather, before we move on, yeah, there's a question that also relates to that being able to close look and touch and that sort of thing in the chat. Hillary sure. has asked, are the beads painted gold or are they reflecting the fabric color? Which is something that you can tell up close that we can't necessarily tell from the photo. That is a good question. The beads are not clear 
they are, they do have like a metallic, um, I don't know for sure if it's like, um, it could be gold leaf that's incorporated into the glass. I don't think it's just paint. Um, it's a little hard for me to say, but they are not just clear. It's not just the color of the underlying fabric. The bees themselves do have metallic pigment of some kind. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so now I have uh, a couple of examples for you that I want to show you the kind of extreme ends of the 1% and the 99%. So first, let's talk about another 1% piece of clothing. So one of our long-time long donors is Ann Bass, who unfortunately passed away in April. She, it was not from COVID, she had cancer. Um, she had been donating to us for many years. And Anne was one of the, I guess, very fortunate part of the 1%. She was originally from Indianapolis. Um, she was from kind of an upper middle class family. Her father was a, a doctor. And, um, you know, so she grew up with some, some means. Um, but she married a, a, a Texas oil billionaire named Sid Bass. And most famously, uh, they eventually divorced. And at the time of the divorce, she received what was the largest ever divorce settlement. <laughs> it was, you know, billions of dollars. So she took the money, she moved to New York City, she had houses elsewhere as well. I know she had at least one property in Connecticut, for example. Um, but she could really, she could afford to be a true haute couture client. So if you're not familiar with haute couture, let me take just a moment to kind of explain what this means because it really helps you to understand what the experience for the 1% is like. And my glasses are like bonking in and out here and it's kind of driving me crazy. Let me put on my glasses that the green screen doesn't recognize as being green. All right, <laughs> that'll be a little better. Okay, so haute couture is not like the clothes that you and I wear. True haute couture is legally defined in France, and it has. there are many things that you need to do to be considered a couturier. So you need to have an atelier in Paris. You don't have to be French. You don't have to be from Paris. You don't even have to live in Paris, but you do need to have an atelier that's in Paris. You need to employ a certain number of artisans, local artisans, to work in your atelier. Every single garment must be fitted to the individual client at least once. And typically things are fitted several times, not just once, but that's the minimum requirement. So these are things that are bespoke. They're made by hand. No two are ever exactly alike. Now it doesn't mean that they don't use any machines. Um, sometimes they do use machines, particularly for extremely elaborate types of embroidery. Um, but much of the work is done by hand and it's generally very, very highly skilled work. So just looking at this dress in a picture, I mean, you know, it's pretty fancy, but, um, but if you could see this in person, I think you would really be just stunned at the craftsmanship that went into this dress. So let me talk a little bit more about it. So this is, this was made in uh, the atelier of Christian Dior. Of course, he had long since passed on, but other people took over his house. And this is from the winter 1987-1988 collection. Now, you might think, okay, this is individually handmade. Oh, sorry, one second. She says they're on their way. <laughs> Note for my son. Uh, you might think, okay, so these are all individually handmade and you can make anything you want. You know, is this even really fashion anymore? Well, if you think about what was being made and worn around the same, same time period, there are some similarities. So let me show you what I think is one of the most striking similarities to this dress. And that was an outfit worn by Michael Jackson. So this is an outfit that he had made for his bad tour in 1987-88. This was a, a very popular, you know, platinum Grammy award winning album. This was the peak of his popularity. And um, during the tour, he was in London. And, uh, and there's a description of this outfit on the uh, Textile Research Center 
website if you want to read all the details of it. It's pretty fascinating. So basically, Jackson was in London and he just happened to see an outfit in a shop window. And he, I guess, was really impressed by it and said, that's what I want, you know, for, for a performance costume. Get me that thing. So it turns out that the, the uniform was a military uniform and it had this really elaborate, expensive gold bullion embroidery made by arguably the top embroidery atelier in the UK, which is called Hands and Lock. They make embroidery for the royal family. They make embroidery for top military officials, not just in the UK, but in other countries as well. And this is actual gold that's being used. This is, I mean, just really incredibly expensive uh, and beautifully done embroidery that was with tremendous skill. So, so Hand and Lock got this request from him and it needed to be done really fast. I, he was on a deadline. He, he's already on tour. He doesn't have a lot of time for fittings. And they were like, all right, well, it's Michael Jackson. We're going to make this work. So uh, they did manage to make it work for him. It helped that he was a very slim, petite man. And um, they were able to kind of quickly put some things together based on other clients they'd had. And he was thrilled with it and he wore it on the tour. So now the Textile Research Center is uh, very fortunate to have this, this costume. All right, so the Dior outfit has the same kind of gold bullion embroidery. However, it was done by a different embroidery house that is in Paris. So this embroidery house is called Lesage. It was uh, started by Francois Lesage, um, and they actually did work for a number of different couture houses. Now, unfortunately, when Lesage passed away, um, his some of his um, embroiderers were absorbed into the house of Chanel. So the work didn't completely disappear. However, uh, it is no longer open to any couture house that wants to use it. Um, Dior had to kind of create their own in-house embroidery team after this. But Lesage was still alive in the 1980s. So I'm gonna show you if it'll work, hopefully it'll work, this really quick YouTube clip where they actually interview Lesage and you can see some of the skill that goes into doing these embroideries. I'm not 100% sure you'll be able to hear the sound, but I will close caption it. Let's see, skip the ad. Yeah, I don't think you're gonna hear the sound, but that's all right. Just double checking, can you see the closed captions that are in the video? We are still seeing your presentation slide. Oh, you are, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Okay, let's see. Uh, new share, here we go, I bet this will work. Can you see it now? Yep. Okay. And the captions. Okay, perfect. So I already started, don't let that throw you. So this elderly man that they're interviewing is Francois Lesage. And he's pulling out this embroidery. So they're talking about how Chanel wants to do a new design. And he says, oh, this reminds me of something we did, you know, back in the day. And he just pulls out this example from his archives of something they had made for Catherine Deneuve, who is a famous actress in France.
Okay, so at least you can see some detail of like just this incredible embroidery. And again, I so wish that I could show you this embroidery in person. I hope that when this pandemic ends, more of you will be able to come and see what we have. So, so this is all hand applied embroidery. It takes a lot of skill. There are people who work full time just doing embroidery. Um, so this is the, the quality of the materials. Um, now getting back to the question of what does it cost, this is actually an example where we have the cost. So when this was designed, the uh, so at the time, the couturiers were doing hand-drawn illustrations of their uh, kind of samples of what they were producing that year. So of course there are runway shows, but then sometimes you have clients who can't make it for the runway show and they would put together these folios of illustrations, often hand colored, hand drawn, and then they would attach little samples of what the material might be like so that the clients could envision the dress. So this is a special service just for their ongoing clients. It's not like something that they made mass quantities of and just sent it out there. Like you, you really had to be a big player in order to get these illustrations. So Ann Bass was one of these longtime clients of the House of Dior. And so they sent her these illustrations and they attached a price. So the price they attached, you can see at the bottom, is 127,000 francs, but they were willing to give her a discount, I'm sure because she was an established client, of only 110,490 francs. I calculated what this would be in 2020 US dollars, and this is the equivalent of $46,000 for this one dress. Obviously, this is not the kind of thing that any of us who are in this webinar have ever worn and will probably ever wear. I cannot imagine spending that much money on a dress. I don't have that much available to spend on a dress. Now I will say, <laughs> when you do spend that kind of money, it goes in a lot of directions. It goes to the couture house, it goes to all of the artisans who work in the couture house, it goes to the models. So it's not like it's just going to, you know, I mean, I'm, some of it now, uh, Dior is owned by LVMH. So some of it, of course, goes back into the pockets of other billionaires, but there are also lots of kind of lower level people who are just working, making these extraordinary garments that do benefit from the system as well. So I don't want to make it seem like, oh, you know, it's just billionaires, nobody else benefits. There's a, there's a lot more involved in this industry, even at the 1% level. Okay, let me show you a very different kind of dress. So this is a factory uniform. So this is from an earlier time period. It's from 1943. The person who wore this, just like the Ann Bass dress, was also the donor. So this was donated by Dr. Margaret Hopper. She grew up in Indiana, and for a few weeks in 1943, during World War II, she worked at the Republican Aviation Plant in Evansville, Indiana. So we now have this outfit in our collection. We're really incredibly fortunate to have it. Uh, because not a lot of these kinds of, uh, you know, authentic Rosie the Riveter uniforms still exist. A lot of them wore out or people didn't think to keep them. It's, it's unusual that this exists. And we've actually lent it to the Smithsonian uh, for some time. So uh, this is made of rayon. It's woven. It's really quite plain. It actually kind of looks a little bit like a prison jumpsuit. Uh, when I first saw it, that's certainly the image that came to my mind. It's not, it's not fancy. It's very utilitarian. But of course, there are there is still much to learn from this about fashion, about the person who wore it, and about what the experience is like for people who, you know, the kind of person who works in a factory instead of owning billions of dollars and living a life of leisure. So here's an image from 1943 from that plant. And what I noticed about this photograph, if I mean, if, if this wasn't a webinar, I'd ask you, what do you notice about this photograph? But I'll just tell you, <laughs> the most important thing I noticed about this photograph is not just women working in the factory, although that is, of course, very important. It was, a, it was really a big change for a lot of women, not only to be employed outside of the home, but to actually work in factories and have these industrial jobs. But the other thing I noticed about this photograph is that 
nobody's wearing exactly the same thing. These women, what we might call their uniform was definitely not a uniform that was supplied by the company. It was not a uniform in the sense that we think of it now where everyone's wearing the same thing. Maybe they buy it, maybe the employer buys it, but it's all roughly exactly the same, just different sizes. They're all very, very different. Now, if you look more closely at the Rosie the Riveter outfit on the right-hand side, you see the trademark of the company that made this outfit. So Donatog, uh, I've, I've been doing some research about service industry uniforms. So I'm pretty familiar at this point with a lot of the brands of the uniform manufacturers, but this particular outfit was not made by a uniform manufacturer. It was made by a company in Texas that was making quote unquote leisure apparel. So this is just ordinary ready to wear. This was not made specifically to be a uniform. Um, it's just kind of something that really anybody could have come off the street and purchased. So I think that's really interesting to think about wearing something to go work in a factory, but it's not a uniform. It's not technically designed for that purpose. Um, pants were still fairly unusual for women during that time period. In the 1930s, you started to see some actresses wearing pants, um, mostly offset. This is kind of their, you know, uh, leisure time look. A, a handful would even wear them for events, like Marlena Dietrich, for example, who was really well known for wearing men's tuxedos to events, but it was still pretty scandalous. This is something that actresses could get away with, but in ordinary life uh, in the US in the 1930s, women were still getting arrested for wearing pants. And you might think now, like, why? How did that happen? But the reason that it was happening is because the dominant thinking at the time was, if you're a woman wearing pants, first of all, you must be trying to impersonate a man. How dare you? This is so scandalous. Because it's so scandalous, you must be up to no good. What are you doing? Are you a prostitute? Are you you know, trying to disguise yourself, pass yourself as a, off as a man, have a job that shouldn't be yours. It really, it raised a lot of questions and literally led to women being arrested for wearing pants. So the fact that by the 1940s, this leisure apparel company was making outfits that happened to have pants. And I mean, granted at this point, like if you're working in a factory, wearing pants is much more practical than wearing a skirt. Um, but it had not been long long since pants had even become something that the most progressive women were wearing. Um, and the market expanded in the 1940s because of the needs of women who are working in factories and farms and often taking over uh, for men who were not available. Um, last thing I want to say here is kind of just a little bit about, I, I said that I returned to the concept of costume. And I, again, I think this is really important to think about um, in terms of democracy, what can we learn about different types of people who participate in democracies? So I think it's really good to be mindful of the difference between costume, fashion, and dress. So Elizabeth Sage used the word costume, and when she was using it, she really meant that costume was what people wear. It was not about dressing up to be something you're not. It was just, my appearance is my costume. I put on my costume. It wasn't like a Halloween costume. Currently, the way that we use the word costume is really more about performance. So it is about taking on a new identity. It's for actors, Halloween, cosplay, uh, drag queens. There are all kinds of performers who use costumes. And often it is to take on some kind of different persona, sometimes a fantasy perform or a, a fantasy per, uh, persona. Um, but you're really, it's a special thing. It's an art form. And we do have some true costumes in our collection, mostly because of the Glenn Close collection, but we do have some other performance costumes as well. Fashion, on the other hand, when you're thinking about studying fashion, you're really talking about studying change over time. So changes in styles of dress, changes in technology, changes in materials, and also just changes in interest. Um, fashion changes as society changes. And US society has changed a lot over the last 150 years since we started making ready to wear clothing. And you absolutely see those changes reflected in fashion. 
But fashion is also about conformity, about groups of people kind of reaching similar conclusions about how they want to live and how they want to dress. And there is an element of fashion that is about trying to demonstrate your social position um, and wanting other people to, you know, show their social position. We use clothing to read things about one another. We read things about gender, your occupation, your social class. And, um, and so fashion has this element of conformity to it. We, we expect to be able to read other people from their clothing and that's largely what fashion is about. Sorry, I'm sure you can hear my dog back barking in the background now. <laughs> my son's friend is showing up. Uh, pandemonium. The last term I want to introduce is dress. So dress is really um, everything that's in our collection could be considered dress. Not all of it is fashion. Not all of it is costume, but everything is dress. And dress means body supplements and body modifications. So anything you put on your body, you hold on your body, cosmetics, body paint, even weightlifting, dieting, anything you do to change the way your body looks, feels, smells, sounds, those are all things that have to do with dress. And it's a very expansive and very inclusive concept. So I, um, the official title of Sage Collection is Elizabeth Sage Historic Costume Collection. Costume doesn't mean that we only collect performance costumes. It relates back to that historical definition of costume, but I actually have grown to prefer that term um, because I think fashion is actually much more exclusive. And I really, I think that we should be careful to consider not just what the 1% wear, but what the other 99% of us wear. I think it's really important to be as inclusive as possible and because dress is so humanizing and we need to be able to see ourselves in a wide variety of other people's experiences. All right, so that was that was all of my slides. <laughs> Thank you very much, Heather. So um, we do have another question in the chat and it is, do you have items in the collection that were meant for the 99% but imitated fashions of the 1%? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think about like fashion, that's a big part of generally what fashion is. I mean, not all fashions start with the 1%. There are definitely fashions that start at lower levels. So if you think about blue jeans, for example, blue jeans were originally invented for gold miners. They were a very utilitarian style of dress. In fact, that's why they have those copper rivets at the corners of the pockets, because it really helps to prevent the pockets from tearing off. <laughs> So they're very, I mean, that's why I like jeans now, like jeans are starting to get more comfortable because we have spandex and sometimes they have like rayon or something that's a little more comfortable, but they're meant to be a really utilitarian, hard wearing garment. So that's a, that fashion is spread and now everybody wears jeans, but it's not something that came from the 1%. So it can go both ways. Yeah, I was just going to say things kind of go both ways because we also see, um, especially kind of with things from other places, they become really popular and sort of all of a sudden, oh, this garment from elsewhere is now, you know, which is maybe an everyday kind of thing in that place. Mm -hmm. It's brought over somewhere else and then somebody wears it and then it becomes popular. But then after a while, it, more people start having it and then it's not cool for the 1% to have anymore. So <laughs> it feels like those are the cycles, the way they go. Does that kind of, I know that's simplified, but. That is true. I mean, yeah. Um, what you're talking about in terms of things being dropped, adopted across cultures, that relates to a term that's called cultural authentication. So it's very, I mean, this is something that's happened for hundreds of years. Like, of course, we, we see something exciting and new and that's come from some other part of the world and we adopt it. And sometimes those things really take off or we get access. Like today, we think of calico as being a very like kind of stuffy British thing. Uh, but calico was originally from India, and it was it was a trade good. <laughs> but it's, it's one of those trade goods that really took off and became popular, and then people in the UK started imitating it and making their own versions. <laughs> so I'm going to loop back to one question, but this 
mentioned calico and so we're on the topic of fabric we have a question that says can you tell us about fabric choices and how those have changed uh okay um sure so historically i would say the underlying fabric choices i mean there was, there were always some class distinctions because if you think about like silk for example silk does not grow in north america so that's the kind of thing that only a really wealthy person could wear historically. It's kind of changing now because um, China is so dominant in the silk industry and the cost of labor in China is still relatively low, which is why silk is now quite affordable here in the U.S. But that was not always the case. Um, but historically, until the mid-1800s, pretty much everyone was wearing natural fibers because that's all that was available, <laughs> with rare exceptions. So if you think about, well, what did make the 1% different at that time? Certainly part of it was the skill of constructing really elaborate garments. But then the wealthy would also have things like, for example, we have um, a couple of really amazing dresses in the Sage Collection that were worn by a uh, prominent family in Columbus, Indiana, who were presented to the court of the King of England. And these dresses, which are also couture from Paris, have cloth of gold and cloth of silver. So this is a mixture of silk and real gold or silver threads. And it's just an unbelievable material. I wish I could show you these things in person. Um, those dresses also have um, rhinestones and kind of faux pearls hand sewn on them and then also there one of the dresses has these um like not buttons exactly they're more just like cabochons attached to the dress and but i thought okay well this is really before plastics were invented like what is this material so i looked it up and i found out that um there is a workshop on the island of Mallorca that has a secret recipe for making things that look like pearls, but it's actually like their own, you know, secret way of manufacturing artificial pearls. So it's not a plastic, it's a natural process, but it really looks like pearl. And um, apparently the Spanish royal family still patronizes that workshop to this day. So this is a very old, like pre-plastic, but faux pearl. Um, so certainly the wealthy have always had access to certain kinds of like very rare materials that not everybody has access to, but everybody was wearing natural fibers because that's all there was. Now, uh, mid 1800s was the invention of rayon. And then in the 20th century, you started to get nylon, polyester, acrylic, acetate, and all of those materials have really radically reshape what is possible with fashion. And a lot of things come and intersect there too. So industry, industrialization, things about ecosystems, you were talking about natural fibers and things that change there in the processes. So lots of different things. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's one yeah. of the things I love about studying dress is that there's no subject that doesn't relate to it. I mean, we can talk about climate change and how that's impacted fashion. <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, so we have another question, which is where in the costume fashion dress model would you put Native American regalia? Mm. I mean, it's absolutely dress because dress is a term that applies to everybody. Now in terms of fashion, I um, recently published, this is just last, yeah, last year, I published an article about a collection of amulets that is now part of the IU Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, formerly the Mathers Museum. <laughs> and um, I can't really call them fashion per se. They were definitely not made as fashion and they were not made as art. They were made as kind of spiritual slash medical devices. They were meant to treat people's maladies and thoughts varied about what the cause of those maladies might be but so so think of them as both medical devices and spiritual devices but the great thing about that collection of the Mathers is that there are a bunch of these amulets all from the same group of people in the Congo the Tatala people all from a very narrow time period and so it actually gives you I think a good sense of what did amulets look like in that particular time and place so if we take that as like a benchmark for fashion, we could do research now about, like, I'm pretty sure that people are still using amulets in Congo, but they might look very different. So 
what has changed, if anything? There's a little bit of evidence that even into the 19th, like I found some writing in the 1960s about how things had started to change a little bit. For example, there was uh, there were some soldiers involved in a war who were using amulets to try to protect themselves in battle, and um, and it wasn't working like they had hoped it would. They started losing faith in the amulets, and so um, the the solution to that was to incorporate um, verses from the Quran into amulets because they thought, okay, well our religion isn't working, but maybe this other religion will. <laughs> so. So it was clear, I mean, clearly they're open to some changes and I, I have no idea what's happening today, but it would be fascinating to find out. And I think that we really can look back at much older pieces and consider like, you know, it's not just timeless. Like if I'm thinking about Native American regalia, it's not like there was no change in those cultures over time. Of course there was. We might not have any material evidence anymore to really understand how things change, you know, 200, 300 years ago, but that doesn't mean change wasn't occurring. And at least we can see what we have available and then be mindful about paying attention to changes that are occurring now and in the future. Yeah, so while I'm waiting to see if other questions come in, that is a really good segue into another of my questions, which okay. I'll in right now to give other people a chance to type. Um, so you talked about the 99% and the 1%, and you mentioned sort of in passing that um, it was pretty unusual and special that you had that factory uniform. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of relates also to what you were just talking about. So can you say a little bit more about collecting these types mm -hmm items and and right. he, we've heard a little bit about and maybe we can imagine a little bit about how the one percent collecting goes right, right. Maybe it's a model that we're kind of familiar with but can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about that collecting and working with and representing the 99 percent and and balancing that within one yes. and like maybe the the things that go into that are the challenges Yes, this is a really good question. And in fact, I meant to mention a little bit about Ann Bass and her collecting habits. So um, so shortly after Ann Bass passed away, we got a message from, I assume, you know, like her daughter or grandchildren or something like that, somebody who was involved in settling her estate. And they wanted to know what she had donated to us over the years. So we compiled a list of all of her donations. Now, granted, she'd been donating for like 20, 30 years, a long period of time. Each page in this list has maybe 20 objects, but the list is 600 pages long. Right? This is a phenomenal amount. I mean, literally millions of dollars worth of clothing. But she could afford to collect like that. We were not the only museum she had donated to. In fact, her first choice museum was the Met. We got, we were the second choice. <laughs> Uh, so she had a huge wardrobe. She was constantly sending us things. Um, but also she was taking them as a tax write-off. And a lot of things that she was buying, she knew, you know, hey, a museum is going to be interested in, in this. Like she was the kind of person who was aware of museums, engaged in museums, aware of philanthropy, and really like ready and willing to donate things to us. Now thinking about the 99%, Sometimes, of course, in the 99%, you have people who are like that too, like especially people who are well-educated, associated with museums, collections. Um, like we have, you know, things, for example, from former IU professors, academic regalia, we have Herman Wells' Santa suit. I mean, you know, there are lots of people locally who do think like, oh yeah, I should donate this to a collection. But the real challenge comes in with people who don't have those kinds of connections. So one thing I'm personally interested in is trying to grow some of those areas. So for example, I've been doing research about the history of service industry uniforms in the United States, and we have very little in our collections. So we have some flight attendant uniforms, thanks to a donor who was interested in flight attendant uniforms. Like he wasn't wearing them himself, he was buying them at auction and then probably, you know, thought, all right, I'm done with that. Let me give them to a museum. <laughs> um, we, a couple of years ago, received a domestic servants uniform and it was from a woman whose mother had had a maid and saved her maid's uniform. 
so she also wanted to give us a wedding dress. We were less excited about that because lots of people offer wedding dresses. <laughs> but when she offered us this servant's uniform, we were like, yeah, that's, that's great. We'll take anything you want to give us. Um, so we have that. We have some nurses uniforms, but there are lots of categories of occupations that we have nothing. So I've been collecting a bit on my own, mostly through eBay, honestly, or through things that people randomly give me. So I now have uniforms from medical professionals, from waitresses, barbers. But if you think about all the different service industries that people engage in, both historic and current, I mean, like gas station attendants and doormen and people who, you know, like sanitation workers. I mean, there's all kinds of different categories that we have no examples. And a lot of that clothing gets worn out. But the bigger problem is that nobody thinks it's worth being in a museum. They're like, oh, yeah, that's what, you know, my dad used to wear. And who cares? Like, throw it out. What they keep is like their wedding dress. And that's why we have so many wedding dresses. But I'm really fascinated in the much more ordinary things that people don't think are special. But they also are really important for understanding people's experiences and how clothing has changed over time. And I think what you just said, that phrase, worthy of being in a museum, mm -hmm. is pervasive. And I think for me, that links back to the sort of core interest in the idea of democracy and collections. But there is this sort of idea that's floating out there that a lot of people share about worthiness and museums and value and, and there are some of those things. And I think, um, and also just like you were saying earlier, terms like costume that are maybe not terms that people are using in everyday life unless they're talking about particular holiday wear perhaps, or maybe national dress, that sort of thing, you know, people think, oh, you know, that's somehow a set aside special category and mm -hmm. interest in my shirt from when I was working, you know, at McDonald's or, you know, whatever, that sort of stuff people might not necessarily think about. Um, yeah. We have a, a comment um, from Jeannie Smith that says, I have the wool jersey worn by the stunt rider in the movie Breaking Away in the scene where they rode behind the truck from Indianapolis. That's Once awesome. Do we want it? Yes. 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 <laughs> All <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome. Excellent. Bring it on. We'll just do a real-time live acquisitions with Heather now. <laughs> so. Yeah, I understand. I'll have to find it. I, uh, as part of my, oh, Dana Kellams, yeah, as part of my, again, uniform research, I bought a, um, a Burger King uniform from the 1970s, or it must be early 1980s, because I was recently re-watching Back to the Future, and his brother wears that uniform in the film, and I was like, there it is! <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, that's another thing too, right? That's another area of research for these types of collections, especially the sort of everyday part is that when people are doing period pieces. They have to have, you know, somewhere to go to and they can talk to people who were in particular areas. They can go back to yearbooks and family photos and other kinds of things, or they can come to collections like the Sage and say, yes. okay, you know, what does this look like? Um, yes. We're definitely an important repository for people who are looking for, to make period specific costumes. Yeah, we have the closest, I mean, on this campus, our closest link is with the theater department. Um, I'm sure the Met works much more closely with people who are doing, you know, Broadway and uh, film productions, but we're just kind of pretty far from that epicenter. <laughs> Right. There's a comment too that says, I wonder if the US letter carriers would be able to part with any of their uniforms. Yes, we have one letter carry uniform that is honestly in very poor condition, but um, I, I took it for the study collection because I was like, no, this is fantastic. <laughs> so, but it's really, it's in such bad condition that we honestly could never exhibit it. Um, some places are really particular about their uniforms. Kelly has said, I mean, Kelly's also interested in occupational uniforms and from time to time has asked people if they'd be willing, you know, like has noticed people wearing uniforms and asked if they would donate one. And sometimes they're like, you know, no, I'm not allowed to keep these uniforms or, you know. but as things become available, you know, further down the line, like, I mean, you know, you can buy things now on eBay that 50 years ago would have been like proprietary. We can't possibly give that away, but when it becomes old enough and kind of irrelevant, <laughs> then we can collect it. 
Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of watching here. I don't think I've missed anybody's questions. I'm keeping an eye on that. We have time for maybe one more from the audience if there are any more. Um, and in the meantime, I wanted to also ask you a little bit about, you mentioned the history of the collection coming out of the home economics mm -hmm. uh, department. And I am guessing, I feel pretty confident in this guess that that was a very gendered uh, area of study. Um, it definitely was dominated by women at that point, yeah. And so how does that sort of shape how things have gone over time? And again, that's another issue of representation. Um, yes, that's actually, that's a really good question. I mean, we definitely do have far more women's clothing than men's clothing, um, partly because it was women doing the collecting. Um, and also because there's kind of a general sentiment. I mean, if you look at the fashion industry in general, there is also just a lot more activity around women's fashion to the point where um, last year I was showing some of my students our study collection, which is, so we have a small study collection in Kirkwood Hall that students can come and, act, and you can actually touch it without gloves. And uh, so, that's preserving the original mission of the SAGE collection to educate, you know, the next generation of students. So we put things in there when it's like, you know, they're not in good enough condition to exhibit or we have too many of that thing and we can spare one. So it's still quite an amazing collection, but I was showing it to students. And, um, and now, I mean, in my classes, I do get a mixture of men and women. And I think it's important to recognize, you know, non-binary folks and you know there are more genders even than just men and women but um I remember this is a couple semesters ago a male student came into the classroom and he was like wow this is great well you know I've been told that men's fashion is just not as interesting as women's fashion and I said I actually totally disagree I think men's clothing is fascinating and I'm really sorry that we don't have more examples here um certainly as far as dress goes men's dress is no less interesting than women's dress, but we do have a greater proportion of women's clothing in the collection. Yeah. So we have um, another suggestion law enforcement. of uniform would be law, yeah, law enforcement. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I, um, a couple years ago, I wrote an article about the history of prison uniforms in the United States, and I actually acquired a few, like, legitimate prison uniforms. The only one that we had in the Sage collection at the time was part of the Glenn Close costume collection. She had worn it. She did a film in the 80s called Cookie's Fortune. It's kind of, it's a comedy. And at one point in the film, she's in a jail in Mississippi. And it was actually filmed in a jail in Mississippi. And they, you know, bought or gave her an authentic uniform to wear. So that was our only one. Um, they're a little hard to collect because, again, just like law enforcement, you cannot impersonate a law enforcement officer, and they do have to be careful about where those uniforms go when they're no longer in use. But yeah, I mean, I'd love to collect law enforcement <laughs> apparel. Yeah, that's an interesting um, thing to think about is all the additional sorts of rules and regulations around uh, what you collect. Um, so we have uh, two more questions, which I think kind of go well together. Oh, and somebody in the Q&A also mentioned that their neighbor was one of the bike riders in Breaking Away as well. So that's a cool connection. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to kind of bring these two questions together. The first is, where would people be able to view samples of the Sage collection? Mm. And the second, which is a little broader than the Sage collection, is how can someone get advice on preserving old fabrics or garments. Mm, okay. These be the sort of the last two and then I'll do the, a little closing after this. Sure. Um, well, as far as seeing the collection, so because our collection is stored at ELF and ELF is a high security facility, it is a little different difficult to get people in, especially right now because of the pandemic, it's really, it's extremely limited. Um, once things kind of start to get back to normal, hopefully, Kelly and I have been starting to consider a kind of regular tour of our storage areas. Now things are in boxes and garment bags. <laughs> so it's not like it's not a museum. It's not like you can go in and just rifle through anything you want to. Um, but we could take people to see what our storage looks like, pull out some really interesting examples. It definitely would be very interesting. Unfortunately, we don't have our own gallery or museum, so I don't have anything on permanent display. 
Um, we are going to have an exhibit of the Glenn Close collection that should be opening at the end of April, 2021. So that's definitely something to look forward to. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as like getting to come and see, you certainly can write to us, but just because of the pandemic, things are super limited right now, um, but it won't be like that forever, knock on wood. <laughs> um, and as far as preserving old fabrics or garments, um, there is a lot of advice out there on the internet. Um, basically, I would say, I mean, to the extent that you can keep things, like things really get damaged when it's humid. In fact, we had a mold crisis in our own collection, which is what prompted us to move over to the auxiliary library facility. Mold can really damage things in a hurry. Um, insects also cause a lot of damage. Um, sunlight causes a lot of damage to natural fibers in particular. So if you have something that you're really trying to preserve for a long time, it's a good idea to keep it in a dark area that's not exposed to extreme temperatures, like your attic's not a good place, basement's not a good place. You want it like in the back of a closet, preferably put it in something that's acid-free. So like acid-free tissue paper, acid-free cardboard. Um, if it's a hanging garment, um, a good like cloth bag around it made of cotton, unbleached cotton, for example, would be a really good solution. Um, as gentle as you can be with things really helps to preserve them. And I also, if something is really special, never try to wash it on your own. Some old things have really been just irreparably ruined by people thinking like, oh, I'll just throw this in the washing machine and it just disintegrates in there. So if you have something that's really old and well-loved, like give it super, super gentle treatment. And I'm gonna just pop into the chat a link to resources from the Canadian Conservation Institute, which oh, nice. is another, they have really great PDFs and I've cut specifically to the one about caring for textiles and costumes, but they also have other types of collections as well. Perfect. Um, yeah, and I think a general rule of thumb that I've heard, which basically applies to everything that you might want to be saving for the future generations is you can kind of either display it or use it or you can um, preserve it, but you can't do both simultaneously. And so I think a lot of times you have to sort of balance. So that goes with what you were saying about the extra gentle love and care that you give to it. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much, Heather. Um, this is both from the folks in the in the chat who are attending and from us at the Institute. It has been a real pleasure to have you here sharing this information about the SAGE collection with us and your time and expertise. So thank you so much no um, for here and so generously agreeing to do this. Um, for those of you who are attending, if you would like to participate in this, we are continuing this series next semester. So if you have something you want to talk about, let us know. If you you have something you would like to hear someone talk about, let us know. And I can't guarantee that we can do it, but I can sure try to see if we can find somebody who can do that. Um, one of the small good things that is coming out of the new way we're all doing business right now and living in the internet the way we are is that um, we've been able to involve some folks from other places, both um, attendees and participants, so or presenters. So on January 26th of 2021, um, at 3.30 p.m., we will have a session that will be about bias in archival description. And that's gonna be presented by Sarah Milligan, who is at Oklahoma State University. So she's going to talk to us about that. So we hope that a lot of you will join us. Um, and I think we're popping the link to register for that into the chat. Um, so, oh, excellent. I want to hear from volunteers. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Good, good. Definitely. Amazing collection. Fantastic. Um, so we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you again, Heather. Thanks to all of you who were here. Great questions and conversation. It's been great to do this with all of you, and we look forward to being able to do this again. So mm -hmm. take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.